The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. It's the Best Birth Podcast, where we interview experts that elevate you as you prepare your heart and mind to have the best birth. Each episode, we'll interview professionals so you are prepared for pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Our experts will build your confidence and empower you to trust your intuition throughout your pregnancy. This audio is taken from videos on YouTube. Watch the entire episode on YouTube at Birth Made Mindful. You're listening to The Best Birth Podcast. Today we have guest Dr. Jonathan Crowther. He is our resident physician who will be guiding us through what to expect in our bodily changes and how to best work with the provider for the best health of the mother and the baby during pregnancy. Yeah, I'm glad to be on. Dr. Crowther is a husband, father of two beautiful girls, and in his spare time, he is in his final year as an internal medicine resident physician. All that spare time. <laughs> he lives in Castle Rock, Colorado, and practices medicine out of three hospitals and a primary care clinic in Denver. While he has resorted to specializing in internal medicine, he has a passion for supporting and encouraging women who are currently navigating through pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. He has had the great pleasure of delivering multiple babies during medical school, but of course, his favorite experiences were helping to deliver his own two baby girls, Kinsley, age three, and Ray Lynn, age one, whose birth stories were both unique and life-changing. And he's going to be our resident doctor for the podcast. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing, uh, you know, this exciting topic with you guys and uh, sharing a little bit of the knowledge that I have. Of course, I'm not, not the expert, um, but definitely have some experience. One of the many experts that will help us just feel comfortable and confident getting ready for, for birth. It's like a huge deal, and a lot of times we don't even know where to start. So that's where we want to bring you on, Dr. Crowther. What are going to be some of the first changes that we notice with pregnancy? Well, there's lots of changes that can happen um, with the body. Um, uh, I mean, I could talk to you about, you know, in specifics, systems base, which actually might be helpful because because um, sometimes when we're um, dealing with changes going on with our body, we think of symptoms that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things to kind of um, take in account is when um, when you get pregnant, um, the uh, our cardiovascular system we get an increase of plasma like 10 to 15 percent increase um, within the first 12 weeks of gestation by your second trimester you're getting up to about 40 to 50 percent increase so mm -hmm. what happens is you get actually what's called a physiological anemia of pregnancy um, and so you get a little bit you know if you were to get labs from your provider, you might see that your hemoglobin level might be just a little bit low. So um, overall, what happens as well, your systemic vascular resistance starts to drop because um, essentially your blood has been thinned out. And when that happens, um, your blood pressure might be a little bit lower. Um, so you might be noticing that a little bit on when you're, when you're having a doctor um, um, appointment. Um, another thing that happens because of that expansion of that plasma, it actually gives your body a reserve preparing itself for childbirth for an ex expected blood loss. We get around, you know, 300 to 500 milliliters. That's almost half a liter of blood in just a reg regular vaginal birth. And if you were to have a cesarean birth, usually it's around 600 to 1,000 milliliters. That's a good amount of blood that can be lost. And so that change that happens just naturally is an anticipation for, um, for having that blood loss. Um, there, uh, there is one uh, you know, kind of thing that happens with your cardiovascular system as well. As the belly gets bigger, from the uterus getting bigger and baby getting bigger, um, this happens more after 20 weeks of gestation. You can have something called um, supine hypotensive syndrome. And if you've been pregnant, you maybe have noticed this when you're laying flat on your back supine. You can have dizziness, lightheadedness, um, essentially um, feeling very sweaty, getting very pale. 
because what happens is when you're laying down flat, the uterus is actually compressing on your inferior vena cava. That's your blood supply back to your heart. And because it's a very lack of lackadaisical type of um, blood system on that on that right side of the body it makes it so that um, that the blood does not get back to the heart as well so essentially you have reduced cardiac output your stroke stroke volumes or each time that your heart beats is actually getting less blood if you're laying down flat so that's why in pregnancy after 20 weeks once baby's gotten a little bit bigger uterus has gotten a little bit bigger um, it's important to be sleeping on your left side. And even when you're getting procedures or being checked um, at the doctors or by your midwife, you should be kind of on the left lateral position, kind of on your left side, so that way it takes off some of that pressure so you don't have what's called that supine hypotensive syndrome. It's so important to know because oftentimes we wouldn't even think, I can't lay on my back. But right. once we have a little bit of this knowledge, then instead of laying directly on my back, I'm just going to lay on my side just a little bit, and, and voila, we have fixed the problem. There are uh, known to be um, actually heart failure that can come in pregnancy um, for patients. It's usually a pretty rare thing that happens, um, but because of having that extra blood, um, that extra plasma in the blood, and you have essentially more, more blood that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, those who might be prone to a heart failure, um, it can happen. And it's, a, it's, it's like a peripartum type of cardiomyopathy that happens. Um, so if you're having you know, a whole lot of shortness of breath, shortness of breath when you're walking around, shortness of breath when you're laying down, especially when you're flat, or you're sleeping at night and you wake up gasping for air, those are actually signs, or, or even you know, swelling, pitting swelling that happens in your legs. Those are signs that you could be having, you know, some of these signs of heart failure, and it could be good to be checked by a physician at that time. Um, I'll go on to kind of what happens with the kidneys and the general uh, genito urido uh, system. Basically, kidneys just get more of that fluid because of that plasma increase. They um, tend to actually get a little bit bigger in size, um, but uh, so it makes that their filtration is working a little bit higher. Uh, differences that happens with your um, with your uh, lab work could be a little bit of low sodium that could happen, and that's just a dilutional aspect of the plasma volume. Um, is that why we always have to like pee more when we're pregnant? Yes, you are peeing more when you're pregnant because you are filtering out so much more volume um, mm -hmm. because of that increase. Um, but not only that, there's another thing that happens. You pee because you're pregnant because a little uterus sits right next to the bladder, right? And so as that uterus expands, it actually presses on the bladder. And, and that's why that urgency to have to go pee more happens a lot more. Um, you, in fact, you can even get what's called hydroureter and hydronephrosis, which basically means backup of some fluid within the, um, the kidneys and uh, the ureters. Now, this is normal to happen, um, but because of there being a little less, um, more backup and less flow of that urine within the, the ureter sy system, it makes you more prone to actually developing a kidney infection. You may not have any symptoms of uh, burning with urination, but you might have symptoms of you know, frequency. If there's any sort of bacteria while you're pregnant, we treat infection because we don't want that pooling of, of urine that happens within the ureter, with ha which happens within the bladder and the kidneys to actually cause a, a kidney infection. And when you do have a urinary tract infection, are you able to take that medication while pregnant? Yes, the medications that they will choose will be um, ones that are safe for mom, safe for baby during pregnancy. Um, I remember not understanding this concept my first time around and just like completely suffering, just trying to drink as much cranberry juice as I could manage because I thought, oh, I'm not allowed to take medication for this. And so I think having some of this knowledge just reminding us that even though it might be a different medication than if you're not pregnant, like our provider has something that will help with this infection. Yeah. 
Yeah, I got more UTIs than, than my whole life when I was trying to get pregnant. So there was that complication as well. So just being aware of how to treat it or how to notice it is good too. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's normal to have symptoms of frequency with urination, getting up in the middle of the night to have to go pee a few times, um, feeling like you have to pee right away, peeing very often, and also, um, you know, cough, sneeze, you lose a little bit of urine. That's all very, um, very common to happen um, within pregnancy. Um, you can have something called postpartum urinary retention where um, you're just not getting the urine out. And that has to do just with the sheer trauma of the vaginal birth. Uh, causing uh, that trauma will cause that mucosal congestion, um, some submucosal like hemorrhaging, little bleeds that will make it difficult to urinate and, um, and uh, painful too. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually this resolves within four to six weeks after being uh, following delivery on its own. It's good to hear about the urinating part. I feel like the most thing I hear is that first poop after delivering baby. That is not something people like to look forward to. Right, exactly. Because all of it is kind of inter, intertwined and it's, it's from that expansion of the vagina to, to get baby out <laughs> yeah. that birth canal. Um, yeah, so those, those are kind of the big things for the genitourinary system. Um, yeah, do you have any kind of questions there, or do you want me to go on to our lungs? Let's go on to the lungs. Okay, yeah, so for the respiratory system, uh, kind of an interesting physiological thing happens, um, and I could get very nerdy with this, but essentially um, patients who become pregnant will um, start taking deeper breaths instead of necessarily more frequent breaths. But what happens is that they actually cause a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. Basically what that says in big words is that you are breathing off more CO2. And so your baseline CO2 in your blood stream should be, you know, around 40 or so. It, it rests around, you know, 27 or 32. And that, there's actually a very specific reason for this is that um, causing that respiratory alkalosis, it actually causes you to excrete bicarbonate from the kidneys and allowing for any of the metabolic waste products for, from babies, just metabolism, to be excreted through the urine. So, and to think that all just happens with the lungs. Physiologically, there's also things that happen. And this actually happens because of the hormone relaxin, which we'll get to uh, quite a few times here, but relaxin um, causes more of an outward flaring of the ribs, causes the chest wall to kind of um, uh, increase in diameter. Um, your diaphragm with the enlarging uterus will kind of get pushed up, up, but it will still have good excursion, meaning that it will still be able to, to press down, but you might feel a little bit more labored when you're trying to take a deep breath because of the uterus getting in the way. Um, is there anything that we can do to, to create more space? Like, should we lean back to have that breath or is it just something that you kind of get used to? Yeah, you kind of get used to it. Most, most time our consciousness, you know, we, we don't, um, think about taking a breath and our body just does this all very naturally. But when you are kind of more cognizant about it, uh, and we'll get to kind of that feeling of shortness of breath, which is a very... Um, a common symptom to have in pregnancy. Um, uh, essentially, you you can just take deeper breaths. There's actually a osteopathic manipulative technique where you can uh, raise the diaphragm, and that could be something that could be um, helpful in, in the future as well. Um, another kind of interesting uh, tidbit is that um, kind of like the urinary tract, um, your upper respiratory mucosa starts to become hyperemic. You have more glandular lactate hyperactivity. Um, and so essentially you can become more congestive, more nasal stuffiness. You can even have uh, nosebleeds because of these changes. Um, mm -hmm. just, just things that can happen with pregnancy. Um, the 
So dyspnea, which is just shortness of breath, very common to happen in your first and second trimesters when the uterus is actually relatively, you know, small. Um, basically, that dyspnea be happens because of um, the increased progesterone, which causes that baseline decrease in your CO2. And having that respiratory al alkalosis, you actually um, start to feel a little bit more short of breath from it. There's kind of a f funny st study that they did um, with males. They actually injected them with medroxyprogesterone, which is essentially your um, birth pill and through a shot form, right? So they inject that into the males and they looked at their ventilation, but subjectively, most all the males had shortness of breath soon mm. afterward, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's this thing called um, progesterone-induced hypoventilation. Um, now, that's that feeling of shortness of breath that you get in your first and second trimester. And I'm just pregnant, not even that long, and I'm still having this, the shortness of breath. Very normal, nothing to be worried about. The, the issues when you want to be more worried about it and to actually be seen by a physician are things when you're having symptoms such as cough or wheezing, fever, um, having pain when you're taking a deep breath, or having chest pain or even coughing up blood. Those things could be um, uh, indications of something else going on. Um, there's a lot of things that can cause um, these, uh, um, these symptoms that may need evaluation, um, such as that cardiomyopathy that we talked about, that heart failure, um, preeclampsia can, can have this, um, even pulmonary and amniotic uh, embolisms, um, because your, your body actually turns into more of a prothrombotic state, which means that the body likes to clot more. So when we're coming in for our appointments every month or every two weeks, are these some of the things that our doctor is checking when they are, they're doing like the blood pressure and, you know, like seeing how much oxygen we're getting? Yeah, exactly. Making sure that you're not having any sort of hypoxia or, you're, you know, your oxygen levels are doing well. Um, making sure that you're not having other um, uh, symptoms such as wheezing because you may, you know, actually have asthma that is undiagnosed. Um, and this is a time where you're seen so much in, by the doctor that uh, it's, a, it's a good time to catch some of these things that may have go, gone overlooked. Um, so really, you know, the big things with, because the shortness of breath is a very common thing, but say if you're just like having a really hard time breathing, you notice that you're like using all of your muscles to kind of get a breath in, if you're having any sort of strider, meaning you know a sound from your throat because you're having difficulty breathing, um, uh, chest pain, if your fingers are turning blue, um, if you're coughing up blood, um, if you're feeling very depressed or agitated or having swelling around your neck, those are all things to kind of take in consideration and say, hey, I, this is different. I need to be checked out for this. Wonderful. What about our next system? Um, I was going to talk about uh, thyroid, which is actually kind of interesting. Um, essentially, our thyroid hormone does everything, and we usually don't think about it unless you have either hyperactive thyroid or hypoactive thyroid. Um, but in, in general, um, HCG, which is human chor chorionic gonadotropin, you might know this because that's what we test for when you're positive for a pregnancy. Um, so HCG actually activates our thyroid gland. And mm -hmm. so that makes us create more um, thyroxine, which is our thyroid hormone um, in our body. Um, and simply because it, it is supplied by the chorion or essentially the uh, placenta and um, and that rather from the from the pregnancy, so you get a transient subclinical hyperthyroidism. Basically, what that means is your body becomes in a hyperthyroid state, but it's not enough to actually cause huge changes with your thyroid function tests. 
Now, there are some of those people who will actually get overt hyperthyroidism, meaning very much too much hyperthyroid. And then there's overt hypothyroidism that can actually happen. Um, hypothyroidism happens um, due to two reasons. Iodine deficiency, which we don't really have to worry about here in the United States because we put iodine in our salt. Um, two is going to be um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a genetic condition. Um, so if you've already had that, then you might be low thyroid. Um, if you're feeling, you know, overly fatigued, if you're noticing, you know, even weight gain before your pregnancy, um, changes with your hair, your nails, uh, become more brittle, those could be indications of you maybe being more hypothyroid and a simple um, check of your thyroid stimulating hormone or your TSH can be a very telling um, thing. And usually in pregnancy, it's a, it's a standard thing to be checking for. Um, Hyperthyroidism is usually from something called Graves' disease or even toxic nodular uh, thyroid goiter. Um, and you treat it with uh, medications called thi uh, thionamides. But um, essentially, you would have more uh, probably painful neck uh, at your thyroid gland. Um, and you might be feeling a little bit more stressed. Your heart rate might be in the 100s. Um, those are all things that could be reason for uh, hyperthyroid. Um, mm -hmm. The only other kind of talking point to talk about the thyroid is if you do have hypothyroidism, low thyroid function, um, maybe you were diagnosed with it early in your pregnancy, or you already knew about it and you're already taking a medication called levothyroxine for that, or Synthroid. If you already have that medication, um, we increase that by 30 to 50% during your pregnancy. It's better for baby to be more in that physiological hyperthyroid state. And so since many of us will move from a primary care physician to a turtle fetal medicine or an OBGYN, it's our responsibility, right, to let them know if we're taking those medications? Yes, you need to let them know which medications you're on um, because uh, there may need to be a change of medications. You might be on a medication for your high blood pressure like lisinopril, which is actually um, a teratogenic, which means that it's bad for your baby when you mm. um, are taking that. So being off of that during your, your pregnancy is, is going to be helpful. We'll talk about the skin very briefly. Um, you guys kind of already know, you just get this nice glow. Everybody's like, wow, you guys look so great. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially it's all from the relaxin. You're getting more, um, that hormone relaxin is going to um, increase your joint lax laxicity as well as your skin laxicity. Um, hair and, and skin get a good symptom uh, of having a nice little glow to it. For once. <laughs> For once, right? It's the but then we get the postpartum hair and nails and it seems like it wasn't worth it. Yes, exactly, because that the hormone balances are just so much off, and then you get hair loss, and it's it's just not fun. <laughs> oh. But um, the with the musculoskeletal system, you have to think relaxin is a driving factor in a lot of things, a lot of you know just it, um, kind of normal aches and pains that you get in pregnancy. Um, so you think that you get a 20 to 25 to 35 pound weight gain on average for pregnancy. So what happens? Is that is all? You could get more. Um, but in general, the average is 25 to 35. Um, the uh, yeah, center, center of gravity is going to change. Um, so it's going to put a little bit more strain on your axial skeleton or on your spine and your pelvis. So you'll get exaggerated curvature of your lower back you'll get forward flexion of your neck and downward movement of your shoulders to compensate all for your, um, your enlarging uterus. That joint laxity on uh, the lumbar spine makes you a little bit more unstable and a little bit more predisposed to getting muscle strain. Because you have to think, in the spine, you've got the large 
large muscles that you can feel, which are your erector spinae muscles, but then you also have these interspinal mus muscles that are very small. And when there is less, you know, there's more laxity and less support happening with the spine, it makes it very e easy for um, muscle strain to happen. You also see muscle laxity or, or ligament laxity in your knees and your feet. And so pains in your knees and feet back are very, um, pelvis are very common to occur. Um, so the question is, when do these become an issue, right? Um, well, it's not very fun to deal with the pain as it is, but the times where you would want to get seen by somebody is if you're having very severe pain that interferes with your function, um, meaning that not even positional, you know, you get up, you lay down, you're sitting, you're standing, whatever it might be, you're having severe pain, um, and, and especially pain at night when you've kind of relaxed your back. Um, if that's getting worse, that's something to be seen for. Um, if you have pain with, when you're coughing or you're sneezing, um, those are also um, indications of maybe something else is going on. Um, if you have something like a sudden bladder incontinence, um, not just when you cough or sneeze, but you just lose all of your urine, or even bowel incontinence, you lose your stool. Um, that could be some, from something called cauda equina syndrome, where the laxity has gotten so bad that you've actually have compression onto your spinal cord. And that's something that needs to be addressed uh, on an emergent kind of basis. Um, so if there's any sort of associated weakness, sensory deficit, meaning numbness, tingling, um, sharp shooting pains, um, or even, you know, when they check you out, they've got, you've got abnormal reflexes. Uh, those are all indications that you should be checked out by a physician. Wonderful. This is such important information to know that there's certain thresholds that if it's beyond, then it's time to bring it up to your provider. Yeah, I think our exactly. bodies are really good at giving us those signals. And it's been comforting as I've been listening to you that if it's far beyond the norm or something out of the ordinary, that's when it's more likely to need to be seen. Pregnancy is such a change in our bodies and there's so many unknowns, but there's also a lot of comfort that other people have studied things that happen as well. Yeah, and it's always okay to talk to your provider when you're in doubt. Um, you're never going to be faulted by somebody when you're just unsure about what's going on because you know your body and your body's going through a lot of changes. You might be more comfortable at, with baby number two or three, you know, but um, if something's different, that's when you want to speak out. Um, Were there so, any other systems that you wanted to cover for, you know, this first trimester period? Um, I think the most other important um, would just be with the gastrointestinal tract. Um, that's probably the most important um, on, on others. But I'll give you a couple tidbits and then I'll get to that. Um, with back pain um, and um, pelvic pain, knee pain, uh, ankle pain, those kind of pains, you know, just simple things, you know, lift with your back straight. You can use a small pillow for lumbar support when you're sitting. You can sleep on, on the side and use a pillow in between your, in your legs. Um, exercise, exercise before you get pregnant will help to minimize that amount of laxity that happens just normally from the re relaxin and you may have less um, pain during uh, pregnancy. You can use chiropractor, you can use uh, osteopathy uh, for pain reduction. Um, trials that they've done were kind of limited, but there's other things like acupuncture could be very helpful, physiotherapy, uh, working with a physical therapist can mu very much so benefit um, as well as uh, even doing water exercises. Um, so those are all very good things. And then go-to pain medications would be something like Tylenol. In general, you want to avoid NSAIDs during pregnancy. That's things like ibuprofen and Aleve. Um, and then they found that even with you know really severe back pain that um, using narcotics or opioid med medications, usually um, there's no benefit from it and there's just more risks that are associated with it. 
Um, yeah, um, but going on to our GI tract, um, you know, one of the things that uh, people will start maybe complaining about is um, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, and this doesn't just happen mechanically. It is one of the reasons when you later on when you have the uterus kind of pushing up on on your uh, diaphragm. But it's also again from our good hormone relaxin. You have decreased tone of your lower esophageal sphincter, which is what basically separates between your stomach and your esophagus. And so, because there's less tone there, there's more chance for reflux to happen. Um, so treatment for that is, you know, taking more frequent meals during the day, trying to take your last meal at night two to three hours before bedtime. And then if the symptoms really are bad, famotidine or Pepsid is a good uh, way to um, treat that. Um, the, uh, let's see, other GI... Um, issues. You got hemorrhoids common in the third trimester. There are preparation H. There's uh, medications that your provider can give you so that you don't have to um, suffer from um, symptoms of, you know, the anal itching, discomfort, bleeding, um, things like that. And then constipation happens a lot too. And that's because um, there's actually decreased motility that happens just normally with, uh, with, uh, with pregnancy. Um, so uh, to help with that, um, that constipation, eating nice fibrous foods is going to be your best friend during pregnancy and at all stages of pregnancy. Um, and then if needed, you can also take a laxative um, that can help. Um, I feel like we can't escape the first trimester without talking about morning sickness, which should actually be called all day and night sickness, because I felt way more nauseous and uncomfortable at night. Um, can you tell us if there's anything that we should be aware of um, or like different provider recommended medication for morning sickness? Yeah. Nausea and vomiting from morning sickness is a very common GI um, side effect. Um, so... What I would say is um, Zofran is going to be one of your best friends. It's, usually, it's a prescription medication, um, but it can really help with, um, with uh, that morning uh, sickness. Um, some people get it so bad that they're, you know, just having intractable. They cannot stop this nausea and vomiting, and that's where they, they you could even use um, uh, other medications that are both oral, but then there's other suppository medications that you can take, uh, like fenugrin, uh, if needed. And that, those can really help with that nausea and vomiting in that early pregnancy. Um, the other things to take in mind um, with, uh, with early pregnancy is it's very common to have insomnia. Um, so my go-to uh, medications for, for patients that are safe is uh, vitamin B6, as well as taking Unisom. Um, Unisom, it's the doxylamine succinate is the actual um, uh, active ingredient of it. Um, but those can both help very, um, very well. Hmm. Well, thank you for giving us an overview. It's really helpful to begin with the end in mind and just kind of being aware of all these changes that are happening within all of the systems. I felt a little bit like we were on the magic school bus going through all the parts of the body and yes. figuring out what is happening where. So thank you for your expertise on that. Of course, yeah. Is there anything else we should look forward to for the tr first trimester? You know, um, I think uh, the things to look forward to with our first trimester is... Um, just knowing that <laughs> it's cute because babies are, uh, when they're being formed in the, uh, as the fetus, they are sized usually by fruit. And so, you know, um, referring often to your little strawberry or your little cantaloupe or, or whatever it might be, your plum in your in your belly is you know very endearing so it's it's a it's a it's a good thing to kind of look forward to in in that
way. When I announced my first pregnancy, I gave a few navel oranges to some friends to say, this is the size of my baby. Yeah, so that's, yeah that's, that's Well, thank you so much, Dr. Crowther, for joining us on the Best Birth Podcast. We're going to end with our mom squad secret. We have a tip from someone in our community. This is from Christina. And she says, sleep with as many pillows between your knees and against your back early in pregnancy as needed. Your body will thank you when you're seven months pregnant. So just as you mentioned, with that support and all of those things to make you comfortable throughout. If you'd like to share a mom squad secret, we'll have a link in our show notes to the Facebook group. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. Looking forward to coming on again. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. We hope you've been elevated and inspired by this week's expert. Subscribe today so you never miss an episode. And please share our podcast or post on your social media so that other moms and dads-to-be can also have the best birth. Please note that the information provided is based on the expert's insights and personal experience. It is not intended as medical guidance. Please seek the advice of your medical provider as it applies to your specific condition.